friends. Um, firstly, I really want to thank Francois and Ingrid uh, for you and the rest of the leadership here at Red Point. Thank you very much for your hospitality this morning. We really, really appreciate it for your welcoming us, opening your doors to us, to host Daniel here this morning. Thank you. Friends, then to each one of you, thank you so much for coming this morning. We know it's early on a Saturday morning and there's many other places you could have been and many other things you could have been doing this morning. So we really appreciate that you have turned out and uh, to come and equip yourselves and just learn from somebody who have maybe walked a, many, a much different path than you yourself have. And um, I'm very grateful for the turnout. When we started organizing these events, we decided, no, we're not going to put down people to register. But uh, so every evening and every morning when we have these meeting, meetings, it's like a lucky packet. You never know whether there's going to be 10 people or whether there's going to be 100 people, but this is beautiful to see that uh, chairs actually need to be brought in. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Friends, as Francho I've said, uh, my name is Gustav Gross. I'm the director of In Context International. We are a very unique missions organization. Our vision is to serve the church by serving them with a Christian perspective on world news to encourage strategic mission involvement. Now, when one tries to focus on that, it may sound like a mouthful, but practically it's, it's actually very simple. Most of us will follow news, either maybe just South African news or regional news. Maybe some of us are interested in international news. But the reality is the news that we receive predominantly is given to us through the secular media. So we receive the news and everything that's happening in the world from a worldly point of view. But for us as Christians, we look differently at the world. And so we should look differently at the events happening in the world. And this is where In Context comes in to serve you with a Christian perspective on what we see happening globally. A very simple and practical example is the earthquake in Turkey and Syria currently. There's Christians in Turkey, there's Christians in Syria. How is the global church partnering with the church in Syria and Turkey at this point in time so that the church within these countries can be the answer to the people who are hopeless and in the search of help? that the church who has already been positioned there can be the ones reaching out to their Muslim neighbors in those two countries specifically and say, but I'm not only giving you physically help, a blanket or food, we have the true eternal hope as well. So how are we looking at world events? I can go into the Ukraine war. How is the church praying for the war in the Ukraine? How are we involved in the Ukraine? It doesn't matter to which news event we go, there's a Christian perspective within it. And we want to serve the church with that perspective. So our organization has two main departments, a media department that focus on providing this information. And then we have a project department, because in many cases, once we start delving into the Christian perspective, we see that God is opening up opportunities for the spread of the gospel within these news events that we are seeing. So then we have a practical outflow as well. Now, friends, developing a Christian perspective is not something that we sit down in our head office in Cape Town and we just pray about it as a little group and come up with it together. We need the body of Christ globally to help us get the Christian perspective of what's happening within these countries. So we are constantly developing our network of partners around the globe, church leaders, ministry leaders, missionaries, so that if something happens in Nepal or in India or in Syria or in the Ukraine, we can contact these people and say, we are seeing these events happening in your country. This is what the secular media is telling us. What are we missing? What do we need to tell the global body of Christ about these events? And so we have many partners and Daniel is one of those partners of ours. Specifically when it comes to news on Iran and the Middle East, we will contact Daniel as one of our partners who specializes within that area. And we will ask him, Daniel, we are seeing the protests currently in Iran. What should you be aware of? How should we pray? And so it is our privilege to then systematically invite some of our partners to South Africa to give our readers first-hand exposure to them, but also that their ministries can get exposure um, to our readers. And so it's really an uh, honor for me to have Daniel with us this morning. His very unique testimony uh, that he will share with you together with his teaching. And this morning has already been in the making since 2021. 
Uh, when I first sent the email to Daniel in 2021 inviting him here, I told him he knows very well what our ministry does and what we would like him to focus on. But I asked him what has the Lord laid on his heart? Or what is the Lord laying on his heart to speak about in these times? And he said, he doesn't feel like speaking about the wars. He feels to speak about Christ. Because if he says if we can remain focused on Christ within the midst of the wars, then we will know what to do. And I acknowledged and I said, yes, that, that makes sense. But it really came together for me at the end of last year as I was preparing myself spiritually for the year that lay ahead. And the Lord really came and laid Matthew 14, where Jesus walks on the water on my heart. And where he calls Peter out and just that reality of the moment where Peter lost focus of Christ and the turmoil, the wars or the earthquakes or the political corruption being portrayed as wind and waves started drawing his attention away from Christ and he started sinking. And when once that scripture got pressed on my heart anew, I got just so much more excited about Daniel's visit because this is what he already said in 2021 we need to focus on. How do we stay focused on Christ? within the midst of the wind and the waves, so that we do not sink within these times that we find ourselves in. So Daniel, will you please come forward? Uh, Daniel will share a little bit about the uh, four titles of his books that he has brought with, and he will start off with his testimony. We will have a coffee break, and then he will do the teaching. I just briefly want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you will come and guide him through your spirit, Lord. You have walked an amazing path with him, and we pray that you will give him the words, Lord, the testimonies, the things you want him to focus on within this morning, those things that you want to use to come and minister to our hearts, Lord. May you bless him, may you protect him, and may you come and meet with each one of us this morning. And come and plant in our hearts, Lord, that which you have called us for to hear this morning. I pray it in your name of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, it's so wonderful to be here. And thank you so much for giving us this chance to speak about this glory and to encourage one another. I'm coming from a very dark background and you'll see in a moment how he changed our lives. Not only that, he has been using us in a mighty way. Just let me introduce my books first to you. Understanding and Freedom is my recent book. Uh, it's written to uh, respond to the challenges of Muslims toward Christianity. They believe that Christians believe in three gods and Jesus is not God and uh, all of the other things. Responding not only that and also revealing the truth of the Bible to them so they can rely on their consciences, mind and heart and uh, to distinguish between the um, um, wrong and, and, and truth. Um, my life story, the house I left behind, I'm going to possibly share 10 pages of, you, of that with you today. And um, Christ above all compares the world's nine religions and beliefs, gives you a little bit of introduction about everything, um, every one of them. And then the major parts are the questions and responses what kind of questions you need to raise and touch the minds and hearts of people and challenge them. When you know a little bit about other religions, you will hug Jesus so firmly. You will say, wow, mine is the best. <laughs> and uh, my fourth book, Islam and the Son of God, compares Islam with Christianity in all level, gives lots of verses from the Quran that why the God of Islam cannot be the true God and uh, what is wrong with Islam and uh, in comparison with Christianity, why Christianity and Bible is the message of God. I'm going to show you some uh, slides. They speak better than me. 
and uh, reveals to you what, where I've come from. This is the country Iran. It's mentioned in the Bible more than 50, 50 times, Old Persia. Iran is a new name, it's around 100 years old. I have come from the very northern part of Iran by the Caspian Sea. Was born in a Muslim family. My father had two wives and 12 children. And we were all living together. Because I was doing well in the school, my parents thought that I could become also well in religious area. So they encouraged me to memorize the Quran, to recite the Quran. That's the important part. You have voice. I don't know. You have heard. They sing. They recite the Quran. So that voice is attractive, not the verses. <laughs> Most of them do not know what is written there, but some of the verses are not good. <laughs> um, they don't know that. I didn't know that. I just memorized. You know, and um, I learned Islamic rituals from the age of nine. Actually, um, I was invited to different religious ceremonies and perform Islamic rituals, recite the Quran. The mindset for Muslim, especially for people who are involved in religious practice, like I was is that you never, never desire to be a Christian. The word actually Christian and the Jew are used as swear words in most Islamic communities. They call each other son of Jew or son of Christian, you know, just like son of dog, something like that. And uh, so that's the mindset. Uh, and I praise his name that he, I have amazing stories with him, even when I was a young lad. Some of them made me, you know, angry, but they all became amazing part of my story after I believed in Christ. My first story with Jesus started while I was in grade seven. I was around 12 years old. Um, my father sent me to school early. One day we had a sport class in our, uh, in our school. It was a boys' school. Our teacher asked us to go and play whatever we liked in the playground. So uh, we seven boys got together trying to find a game and play with each other. One of the boys said, he knew a game. He jumped and took a paper from his notebook and divided into seven, because we were seven boys, went in a corner, wrote something inside each, and then folded them and then rolled them. He came to us in his, mixed them in, in his palm and uh, said, this is the game, each one of us going to take one and open in turn. It, it speaks about our future, job or whatever. So we took one, and in a friendly way, we were, you know, arguing with each other who should open first, or second, or the last one. I was pressing on for, to be the last one, so I succeeded. I became the last one, the seventh one. We were in grade seven, seven boys. I was the seventh one, open mine. The first one opened, there was written, you'll become a teacher. We just tried to make our time fun with each other, worth trying. And uh, so we jumped, raised our voices, clapped, you know. The second one, you'll become a governor, the other one a doctor, engineer, and each one, each open, the excitement was there. Now it's my turn. I was thinking mine would be the best. <laughs> Why? Because I was more righteous than them. I was more involved with religion. In Islam, the righteous persons get the best. If you read the Quran, the Prophet of Islam gets the best. It's not like Jesus, he didn't have a pillow to put his head on it. Or even he can take your wife from you, according to the Quran. 
in Quran 33, he took his daughter-in-law as his own wife. So that's a righteous. Righteous movements are very wealthy because people give money to them. So I was thinking mine would be the best, better than theirs. And I opened mine, there was written, you will become a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That was the most horrible thing I could have in my life. <laughs> so I was embarrassed. I became angry. I attacked the boy, punching him and told him, I'm going to kill you. I don't care what happens to me. Other boys worried. They came and they were begging me, try to, you know, uh, release him from my hand. I was angry. I was punching them too. But while I was punching him, he was crying, he shouted over me and said to me, did I write it for you? You saw that I mixed them very well. You were just trying to be the last one. We took before you actually, we could have taken that. I didn't put in your hand. Why are you blaming, blaming me? It's your problem. You took it. <laughs> My little conscience said to me, yeah, he is right. So I gave up killing him. <laughs> I, but I did not play with them anymore. And I went and in a corner I was crying. I was so sad why this happened to me. They had all good jobs, you know, everything <laughs> nice. But I never forget that in that Muslim respect Jesus highly as a prophet. And I asked myself a question, why it is horrible to be a follower of a good prophet? So I never found any response to that. And after I believed in Christ, it was amazing that he made some little puzzles in my life. So I could put those puzzles together and to be amazed. I'm speaking here for Jesus, it's because of his grace. I have gone through valleys and mountains, have come to this stage. I finished my high school and entered the university. In the university, I became the follower of this radical, vicious Islamic leader, like the one who is ruling in his place, the present one. Under his leadership, we overthrow the kingdom in Iran. His Reasoning was different to ours. ours. He hated the king of Iran because the king of Iran accepted Israel as a country. That should not happen for Muslims. If you do that, you have to be killed. Jews should not have any land. And actually the Prophet of Islam said, the last day won't come until Muslims have killed all Jews. And so that was his reasoning. Our reasoning were political and social problems. That's all in Islamic countries, you know. Either they, are, they have some democracy or not. Dictatorship is always there. But he promised us, he manipulated us. The Muslim leaders are most manipulating people. It's because their book says, their Quran says, Allah is the best of deceivers. Quran chapter 8, verse 30. And there are in other places also it says that. So the deception is part of the doctrine for the Islamic progress we use this deception. And we didn't expect him to deceive his righteous brothers and sisters. But Islam is a funny religion. If you're the most righteous one, you can still deceive the less righteous one. Anyhow, he promised us that what is problem with us, we should have democracy like Western countries. Democracy actually is coming from Islam. You know, we should have, Shah is not giving that much freedom to people. So, young lads, you know, young people like us were deceived, didn't know Islamic political, social philosophy. Gradually, everybody came under the umbrella of his leadership, and even atheists trusted him. Um, so the Shah left, we captured the country because uh, I was one of the famous boys 
initially with two others invited to start the revolutionary army in Iran. This vicious, vicious army is killing Iranian people. So I was with, the, with two others going to start it. But something immediately happened. I, I praised the Lord Jesus. I didn't know him in that time. He was just leading my steps not to get, get involved in them. He didn't allow me to go in it. So very soon I became opposition to the grand leader because he promised us before the revolution not to take any political responsibility because Iranian people never trusted clergy. They had done horrible things in the past, but he changed his external mood, you know, that um, apparently he said, no, 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 you're going to read everything. But after the revolution, we didn't know that they had already prepared themselves in, you know, um, in Palestine fighting against Jews. They were trained by Russian communism that how to occupy and how to destroy, how to establish. We didn't know that. So immediately after I withdraw from his, you know, I, I rejected his in, invitation. I, the Revolutionary Army was established. He became the chief commander of the army. Anyhow, I was very much disappointed. I left and went to my hometown, you know, just the northern part of Iran, just stay away from this power thirsty clergy. And even they were killing, killing each other. The clergy killed each other in the first several months over the power. Lots of young people were disappointed. So still I was thinking that I was a radical Muslim. He is not a good radical Muslim. I am a good radical Muslim with this mindset went to my hometown and, um, you know, started to serve my nation in that part. And, uh, and also, beside that, you know, I was overseeing, training the young boys and girls with fighting techniques and uh, terrorist techniques and others, how to kill, how to be killed. Just goal was to prepare young boys and girls to go and capture Israel. That's what all committed Muslim thing. And even they are not radical, but they are committed. That's their mindset. Israel belongs to the world, Jew Jewish world. We need to fight in a cultural way, in a, you know, true war doesn't matter. We need to capture. So that was our mindset to blind, it really blind. Whereas the Quran itself says Israel belongs to Jews. Quran chapter five, verse, you know, 20, 21, 22. And actually said any other group must be driven out from there. And even they do not follow their Quran. I was blind actually. I was a reciter of the Quran. I didn't know the meaning, <laughs> you know. Anyhow, and uh, yeah, training them. This is my wife. I didn't bring her, I thought maybe she scared you. <laughs> she was the most aggressive girl among all other girls. I said, wow, this is mine. <laughs> Leaders really love aggressive girls and boys because they are the ones they, you know, uh, do the job. So for the same interest, we got married. This is our wedding day, you see how excited they are? <laughs> Iranian people really are exciting people. They are louder, they are dancer, you know, possibly you have heard Greek also are louder. They are just like Greek people, you know. But there is a difference. Greek people break their place, Iranians love their place. <laughs> they don't break it. And so, uh, but radical Muslims really by identity, cultural identity, do not belong to Iranians. They are just a nomadic, vicious, um, you know, people who follow Saudi Arabian nomadic culture, Islamic culture. Uh, this is after our marriage.
This is um, our first child. She's, she's five, she's not covered like my wife. You cover your daughters from the age of seven because the age of seven is the age of marriage in Islam. The Prophet of Islam actually married to a girl six years old and uh, the parents begged him to allow her to stay a couple of more years at home. So the marriage was consummated at the age of nine. He was 52. It's still his practice, child marriage. Go to this website, click there and cry a little bit. So it's good to know what's happening to this little beautiful creatures of God. The Muslims say it's the problem with the girls, you know. Many of them have become disabled. Their organs mixed and they cannot be kept at home. They are outside and the United Nations also is looking after them. They are complaining but Muslims are not listening. They say it's their problem. It's Allah knows the best. You know, they do not know that Allah is the false God. Allah if he was the right God, he would sacrifice his life for people, not to destroy them. Um, a photo from my family in a, in a holy shrine. This is, this, here I became a, a fully opposition to the grand leader, announced my candidacy for Islamic parliament, as an independent, his group invited me to become their representative. Three times they came to me, I rejected. And uh, there were many other independents. People really were disillusioned with Ayatollah, with the leader and his way of leadership. They, in, in several months, you know, after the revolution, they became disappointed. So they voted for our group and one of my colleagues became the president of the country with 88% of people's votes. Ayatollah lost with 2%, almost zero. But it was too late. He was in power. He was the leader of the revolutionary group called Hezbollah. That Hezbollah shot the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And, um, so he just allowed the election to happen just to deceive the international power government. But after that started plotting against the president, three times he plotted to kill him, but he eventually ran away from the country, went to France. The government was demolished. Some escaped, some were killed. I was one of them caught and put in a death cell, three months I was in a toilet, and after that I got my death sentence, moved to another city, waiting on death row, in a cell with four others who were also, who had death sentence. All four were killed, and I'm here by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that ballot? It was, it was going to happen. I mean, two of my friends, old friends who were in high position, in a significant position, they played, they were with Ayatollah actually, they played, you know, a legal game and released me temporarily so I could run away from Iran and to Turkey. Oh, that, you know, was painful for me. Um, it's, it's a long story, my, my fugitive story, it's a painful story, so I'm not going to stay there. Um, that much. So eventually I entered Turkey. I'm going to encourage you with powerful things happening in my life. So if you want to know more story, you can read the book and, uh, or borrow from someone. Um, Turkey, I entered there. I didn't know about my future. Um, Turkish is my mother language. So a little bit different. I, Several, in several months I prepared myself and then decided to do my doctorate in Turkey in Istanbul University and uh, just m my main purpose was to get a student visa to be able to live there. But in the meantime I love to, you know, investigate. The major of my doctorate with my supervising professor we chose was how cultures, religions, 
and ideologies like philosophical ideologies like communism, socialism, humanism. They shape people's attitude, their culture, their values, their ethics, their leadership, their family, their organization. How do they approach individual freedom? So I had to um, investigate the world's major religions and ideologies to write my doctoral thesis. This is a Christianized version of it. Now, before doing that, I was thinking that I would find the best things for Islam. Because we were always taught from childhood, Islam is the best and perfect religion. That Muslim think, that all Muslims in your country, most of them think. They do not know that by logic, they just have learned Islam is the last and perfect religion. So, I was thinking the same, that I would find good things. It's still, I was, I was disillusioned with Islamic political philosophy in Iran, but I was thinking that this Ayatollah, this Mullahs have hijacked Islam. I never thought about Christianity. Uh, Christianity is taught by committed Muslim mosque leaders. It's a corrupt religion. All corruption you see in the Western countries, it's just because of Christianity doesn't have a good principle to, you know, protect people from that. But after my investigation, I was amazed and shocked. I was shocked that my beautiful religion was the least of all other religions. I discovered that paganism, socially speaking, is far, far better than Islam. Now, Islam is the perfect religion. Two billion Muslims believe that. But Islam is the least of all religion in every way. Socially, spiritually, it's a disaster, just like, like pagans, like other religions, you know. But I was amazed to see Christianity at the top of all in every way. And um, I was really amazed. I'm going to speak about those things that amazed me in my second lecture. I don't want to take time. A little bit of that, you know, it's just amazing. I possibly just speak about freedom to you. I discovered that only freedom makes sense in Christianity. Philosophically and doctrinally. So I'm, I'm going to speak simple in this area for you to understand. In all other religions, gods are the creators of sin and good together, or evil and good together. Sins in all other religions come from God. In Hinduism, in Islam, you know, in Buddhism, that section that believes in God, in all other religions. God is the creator of everything. Everything is from God. In other words, a spiritual darkness is from God. Have you heard about yin and yang? So yin is like our Satan. It's coming, he's coming from God, or it is coming from God. God has created Satan and corrupted him himself. That's in the Quran, chapter 7, verses 14 to 16. Satan speaks to Allah, you created me evil, you corrupted me, so I, in order to corrupt your creatures. That, that's the plan of God in other religions. Corruption comes from God. The spiritual darkness comes from God. Now, question is this, if a God creates darkness, can he be a good role model? Absolutely not. You're teaching your child to go and steal. Will you be a good role model to your children? No. Now, philosophically speaking, it's putting a question mark in front of that, the nature of that God. Muslims believe that God, Allah, is holy. If Allah is holy, can holiness create sin? 
Can holiness create darkness? Absolutely not. Holiness is just like light. Can you ask this light to give you a little bit darkness? No. Why? That's a philosophical response. So philosophy in some parts is just yummy to learn it. It's because there is no any trace of darkness in the nature of that light. That light is 100% light. God is 100% holy. He cannot create darkness. Now, if a God create darkness, that means darkness in his nature. If you have darkness in your nature, can you call yourself free? No. So gods in other religions are not free. Can you be free as their followers? Absolutely not. But your God created everything right from the beginning good and he was happy to see them that was good. His nature is absolutely good. He cannot create evil. The evil is coming after the creation. It's not from God. You see the difference? This God is free. When you follow free God, you make him your model, you're free. You become free. You see, there's no freedom in any other religion. They speak about freedom, but they don't know what freedom is. I discovered that freedom only makes sense in Judeo-Christian belief. And that freedom practically becomes amazing, yummy and delicious. <laughs> Why? Because the author of that freedom is your father, is your daddy. There is no any wall between you and your daddy. Intimate relationship. Intimate relationship hates dictatorship. There is, that's why he said, you're the member of my family. You're, you're my household. You're my child. That intimate relationship between you and God allows him to respect your autonomy, your freedom of choice. In no other religion they respect freedom of choice. Even in New Age and Hinduism. Hinduism said, you're God, I am God. We don't need each other. Rely on your internal being. So it's an indifferent relation, religion. Therefore, freedom doesn't make sense there. Because we are aloof from each other. Freedom only makes sense in a community. You don't go lock yourself in a room and live there and die there and say, well, I'm free. No, no, it doesn't make sense. Freedom makes it in the society. That intimate relationship is his, you know, is coming from his own nature, his image. Respects your autonomy. You can freely talk. You see, in the Bible, you can even fight with God. You cannot do that in Islam. You're killed. You cannot even criticize the Prophet of Islam. You get killed. But here you can kick him out. You can complain to him. You can cry with him. You can laugh with him. You can even tickle him. Because he loves to see you joyful. You're the child. You're the, you know, he's your parent. He's a parent's relationship with their children. It's the most intimate one in the world. Among animals too. It's just God has created us in a way to have that intimate relationship, to use our autonomy. When you use your autonomy, you are free to express your opinion. Then opinions cross each other and you will find the best opinion. Then because you are created in the image of God, you love the best. Everybody loves the best. And even go and ask a person, a, a, a vicious, cruel person, do you like to have the best? The answer is yes. Why? Because everybody is created in the image of God. 
You want the best, best spouse, best brother, best sister, best father, mother, best car, best house. You don't take your money to go to a car dealer and say, I have come here to buy the worst one, purchase worst car, and even cannot move. You know, I cannot take out. You don't do that. You see, it's in our nature. You find the best, you follow the best, you become a creative person. That's why Western countries improved in everything. That's why Islamic countries using everything invented in the Western countries. They don't invent anything. It's because of their God. He is tyrannical. He is dictator. Genius Muslims have no choice to leave their countries and go and live in other countries, in your country too. That freedom is amazing when you have a humble God, an intimate God, an intimate leader, and even in the organization when your leader is intimate. That's coming from Christ. That's coming from the Bible. I was amazed. And all other things amazed me, but of course didn't make me a follower of Christ. Changed my mind towards Christianity. Christianity is not evil. It disappointed me a lot about my own religion. But I needed to know more about Jesus. You know, I was a Steve Dick person. Normally when you're a radical Muslim, coming from that background, have lived in that environment, it's just, it's not easy for you to get changed, to open yourself to change. But I praise his name, really. Even though it was costly for me, he did a miracle in my life, I lost $40,000. Sometimes losing is miracle. <laughs> my business partner took my, a Muslim, an Iranian Muslim, took my money and his run away to Germany. I couldn't chase him legally because company was under his name. Desperate, crushed emotionally. He took almost all my money. Didn't know what to do, trying to find a friendly way to approach him, to find him where he was, but I didn't know any um, friend of his in Turkey. And one day I remember that there was a an Iranian Christian group coming to him. In Iranians who had a church in Turkey, they ran away from Iran after the revolution. So I said, hi, but if I go to this church, maybe they can give me some ideas. For the first time in my life, I'm going to a church for my money. <laughs> It was scary. First of all, you should not go to a church as a Muslim. That's Islam. And you're causing problem for yourself. You can get killed. Second, second I had already, you know, had a death sentence. Really, I was not really wishing to have the second one. <laughs> but my mother was big. Pushed me to go in. I entered the church, I was shocked. They were playing music there. Music in a worship place? That was shocking. Music is evil in Islam. If radical Muslim take over, all instruments gone. Doesn't matter, they are a million dollar or one dollar. That's what happened in my country. In the when, when the clergy took power. But Iranians are very musical, and even Arabic people are musical. But they, leaders, see that Islam sees that as an evil. If they have power, like Taliban, they just smash everything. They kill you. You know, the guitar, the guitar, the guitar is from Iran, actually, originally. It's an Iranian bird. It's invented in Iran. But it grew from Spain. So it's an Iranian instrument, but they see it as a Western instrument. Are young people playing guitar? Some of them are in prison. Oh, you're playing Western guitar? 
So I was shocked. More shocked, there were a couple of ladies standing here with men and singing in front of men. Oh my goodness, you do not see any lady in a mosque. If you see in South Africa, they are manipulating you. That shouldn't be in Islam. You don't see ladies, they are behind the wall. You don't hear their voice. If you hear somebody among men are saying, shut up. Bring your voice down. Fucking. And they're happy. Oh my goodness, happy in a worship place? New things for me. Anyhow, it was politically scared, you know, frightening to me because if a Iranian spy comes and sees me here, oh, he was in an evil place and it's a good excuse for the government to persecute my family. You see, we, we always told him he was unfaithful, not a faithful Muslim, so something like that. So they were all standing, I sat, but closer to the main door. I said, if something happens, I can run out easily. <laughs> but nothing happened. Um, after the worship, they came to me and I, I shared my story with them. They became so sad, they offered their help to me to find him in Germany. They said they had a lot of friends, Christian friends there, and they would write to them and uh, get help from them. They said, come and you know, keep in touch with us so we can share that with you. I asked them, how can I keep in touch with you? They said, come to the church. <laughs> It's scary, really. I mean, unlike my desire, I just artificially said to them, yes, but in my heart said, no, I'm not going to put myself in danger. I went home, I thought, that's all, all my money. I have a family. If God brings them to join me in the future, what should I do, really? And I need to do something. If I don't go there, they think that I have lied to them. I need to be there. So that money pushed me to go again to church. <laughs> Sunday after Sunday. Boy, I found them amazing people. Christians are amazing. Really, people outside do not know that. And even a lot of people from Christian background, they have turned their back on the Lord. They are saying that Christianity holds people behind. They are bigots. I found them amazing in every way. Relationally, that was amazing. They never swear. The yes was yes, no was no. Respect. Oh my goodness. One day I was talking to the pastor, man, and the wife comes also, stays here, and the wife starts to talk, and he is looking at the face of his wife and nodding. Wow. I said, my goodness, wife is talking in front of husband, in front of a stranger? We call this ungodly infidelity. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love to become infidel. <laughs> It was amazing. I am following the most perfect religion and I beat my wife. Quran says, if your wife doesn't listen to you, beat her. Chapter 4, verse 34. Chapter 38, verse 44. Oh, heartbreaking things in the Quran. I was amazed, really. They were so nice people. Not only to strangers, to one another. That caused me to listen to their messages because the Quran says, don't listen to Christians, to non-Muslims. I listened. Oh, I heard the amazing thing about God. One of the things is, that this is it, you know, we need to be able really to describe Jesus to people in order to touch their minds and hearts. They were saying that God in the Bible is the personal God. God is not personal in any other religion. They are impersonal. In other words, they are non-person. What does it mean, non-person? We don't know. We don't know God, who He is. They are following unknown God. 
all other religions. It's the Greek philosophy. You remember Paul was walking in the streets of Athens? He saw to an unknown God. That's in all other religions. Gods are unknown. They are following unknown God. Do you follow an unknown person in your daily life? Do you do that? Do you go to a street and find a strange person? Madam and sir, I don't know you, but I'm going to be your follower. Do you say that? Do you do that? You don't. Why? Because it's dangerous. It's irrational. All other religions are irrational. These people said God is personal. Why? To make himself known. Oh, there are a lot of yummy things behind that. <laughs> God is personal because only personal being can have image. Non-person cannot have image. You cannot attribute an image to a non-person, to impersonal. In other words, gods in other religions do not have brain. Okay. They don't know what to think. No, if that's the case, what does creation mean in all of them? Nothing. So you see how gods are false in other religions? They are man-made religion, but God must be personal in order to have image, to plan in his image, put into practice creation, salvation, whatever. Establishing moral values, ethics. To have a relationship with people. To show his glory. It was amazing. I said, why I... Why did I think about this? You know, I loved philosophy. I always, you know, wanted to investigate. I never, never thought about that. They were ready to touch the heart and mind of people. And then after a while I had a dream. The following Sunday I went to the church. I heard my dream from the pulpit. I was in my father's house, exactly. Alone. Nobody was there. There were earthquakes, houses were destroyed. That's the name of my book, The House I Left Behind. Um, disaster everywhere. People died. Scary situation. Cried to God. There's no one to help me. Jesus revealed himself to me in the dream and said to me, I'll help you come out from your father's house. I rushed out. My father's house collapsed. I said, Woke up, I saw that was a dream. The following Sunday, I went to the church. Preacher was preaching about the verses Jesus said, the wise person builds his house on a solid ground and sand. In his message, I heard the same sentence, come out from your father's house. Leaving the house that Jesus had built for you, nothing can destroy that house. Your dad's house can be destroyed by everything. So I knew he was just speaking about his spirituality. So that amazed me. And I praise Jesus. He is the God of emotion. He is the God of relationship. He is the God of logic. Everything. You know, he was trying to touch my mind and heart and my soul in every way. So that dream, their teachings, my university study all together encouraged me to read the book myself. So I grabbed the New Testament and I started to read the New Testament. New Testament is an amazing book, among all other religions book, either philosophically or doctrinally, socially, ethically, culturally, in every way. It's an amazing book. New Testament not only reveals God to you, but puts your hand in the hands of God. There were amazing passages they touched my heart. One of them at the beginning, just, you know, um, Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 to 21. Jesus is overthrowing the kingdom of Satan and that God said, this is my servant, my spirit is on him to take, to do what? To take justice to victory. In other words, to overthrow the Satan. Then the nation will trust put their trust in him. You see, it's a logical thing that if you are unable to overthrow my enemy, why should I put my trust in you? You see the logic? Amazing. 
And the second passage was so mighty to me was John chapter 1. He is the Word. The Word was God. You know, these are all similar in all other religions. God is the Word in all other religions. But what kind of Word? Unknown Word. Impersonal Word. But here it says the Word became? Why? Because the Word is personal. Why did he want to reveal himself, to become flesh? Because he wanted you to know him. He doesn't like blind obedience. Falling in love with each other necessitates knowledge. If you want to love and be committed, love one another and be committed, you need to know each other. Otherwise, that family is not going to work. That's the same for God. He revealed himself to show his glory, his truth, his beauty to you. So you can see that beauty. You can understand that beauty. You open the door of your heart and he comes in. Immediately the other guy rushes out. Why? Because they don't like each other. They cannot be roommates. They cannot live in one room. One comes, the other one goes. That's only in the Bible. No other religion speaks about that. God is personal because he is functional. You are in bondage, you cannot go to him, but he is free, he can come to you. He comes and sits on the throne of your heart. God is with me, that's why his disciple says, John says, the one who is in your heart is greater than the one who is in the world. Logical. You see? Amazing. So I finished the gospel for the first time. I discovered that God of Islam, God of Hindu, all other gods are man-made gods. They are not real gods. Started to read the gospel for the second time. The love of Christ hit my brain, my heart. It was amazing. I discovered that Christ has the only right definition for love. Love must be unconditional. We don't have anything called conditional love. That's actually betrayal. You know, word is using that relative love, you know. Socialism is ruling now over entire Western countries. This is the relative love. You know, conditional love. Conditional love is hostile, actually. Have you ever said to your spouse, honey, I love you so much, but 85%? <laughs> Have you ever said that? You dare to say that. <laughs> what about 99.99%? Come on, it's almost 100%. Now. That 0.01% is ugly. Oh, darling, I love you for 300, what, 65 days or four days? Just one day I'll be with someone else. <laughs> he is mighty in everything, in his talks, in his philosophy, in his doctrine, in his social relationship. I was amazed, honestly. I said, wow. That's why he says, love your spouse as yourself. Why? If you want to have a lovely family. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? If you want to live in harmony, because you don't go to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't like you, but I want to live in harmony with you. That's not going to work. You need to approach unconditionally. Love your enemy because love changes. I know that. I said, I'm going to give my heart to him. And I did, he did other amazing things in my life. I'm smiling now here. <laughs> He's speaking to those two Muslims. That's an American brother. He invested his own la entire life among Iranian people. He, he passed away two years ago. Brought my wife and three daughters, they joined me. She didn't know I was a follower of Christ. I couldn't tell her. You remember she had a gun? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, 
she knew Islam. If your spouse changes religion, you need to divorce him or her on the spot and cooperate with the Islamists to kill him or her. So I couldn't tell her. I didn't want to push her to that chaos. I wanted her to come and see the changes in my life. The changes are amazing, especially if you're a husband, if you're a wife beater, you're listening to the Quran. It's amazing. That change is amazing. She came and saw that changes in me. I was happy. I was not aggressive. I was playing with my kids. I was helping her in kitchen. I forgot sometimes she was there singing with joy, music. She thought, oh wow, he has lost his mind. <laughs> so in the second week she was afraid that she had hope to come and live with husband, but now he, he is lost. <laughs> and in the second week she asked me what had happened to me. That scared me for the first time from my wife. Because I thought if she knows that that's, she's an aggressive lady, she knows that when I've changed my religion, I'm not leader anymore, I'm not guardian over my children anymore, she's the boss. Minimum, she can take the children and go back to Iran. Painful but she could do more horrible things, you know, to me. even go cry to some other radical Muslim that side. They can come and kill you. Who cares a Muslim is died in an Islamic country? So what to say? I'm speechless, looking at her face. What should I say? In my heart, I started to cry to Jesus, to complain to him. Lord, why are you rushing, Lord? Why are you not giving time to me, Lord? I was thinking for a month minimum or two. <laughs> little by little, you know, reveal things. You're rushing, Lord. What should I do? I mean, this pain is going to happen in my life unless you want to come and help me. Oh, I praise his name. He came. I love the Lord so much. I'm not any better than you, that doesn't say that. I mean, I just have discovered that's the key. He came and helped. She was terrified, she hurt me. She terrified me, but she didn't go back to Iran. Something Lord had allowed to happen in Iran, a horrible thing, she was scared. She said, I'm not going to come back to this country anymore. He did for me. She now is here, but week after week, she said, now this is serious. She thought, maybe, I mean, as husband and wife, they get a little bit separated from each other, and uh, they come together first week, second week, they're nice together. Again, scenario goes back to their giving pain to one another. She thought maybe that was the case, but she discovered, no, this man has changed. Really, Jesus changed him? Gospel changed him? In my absence, without asking me, without telling me, she was taking my gospel, reading it to see. Such a powering gospel, changing a vicious man. She never told me, because of pride, aggressive attitude, and also Islamic. You don't say to, a, to an infidel that I'm reading your book. But I caught her one night with my book. <laughs> I woke up in the morning and uh, it, it was around two o'clock. She was not in the room. I waited, she didn't come, but that worried me. I went out, I saw the light was on in the living room in a corner, she was reading a book. I went closer, I saw that was my book. I said, what are you doing? It's two in the morning. Oh, you're reading my book? It was amazing. She was reading Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 is the most powerful chapter for Muslim women. One husband, one wife. She always loved it. But she had, did not have any support. Not, neither Allah supported her, nor Islamic culture. She opened the book randomly. 
she reads a little bit and then says, oh, this book must be a good book. <laughs> and I saw that, I said, oh, that chapter is an amazing chapter. She smiled and she said to me, it's not your business, go and sleep. <laughs> so I went to the, to the room, shut the door, knelt down, cried to him. I said, you're, um, you're an amazing evangelist. You can touch hearts and minds. And after that, that was a good excuse for me to encourage her to you know, join ladies meeting and she was afraid, really, it's terrifying, you know, you reveal yourself, you are in, you know, have, having fellowship with Christians, something like that. She didn't want to go and I went and encouraged the church ladies and eventually they were successful to get her to their meeting. She went to the first meeting, she was amazed finding them is speaking like princesses, free. Ladies and girls, you are the crowned princesses of the Lord Jesus. Live like the heavenly princesses. Let's men, your princes. We are crowned by him. She was amazed. She didn't want to go there, you know, she wanted to go there because she was afraid she wanted she went there to find them an excuse, come and use that excuse for me. But she didn't know that Jesus was clever. She went there amazed, came home. I said, how was it? She said, yeah, it was good. Are you going to continue? Yeah, I think so. After that, she took it serious, read the gospel, and eventually gave her heart to the Lord. And the Lord changed the entire family. My brothers and sisters, we need to love him so dearly. That's the key. When you love, you become vocal. It's impossible to fall in love with someone and keep quiet. That's the key. God bless you. I think I think you have um, Great. Um, why to focus on Jesus Christ in turmoil and deceit, or in all circumstances? And turmoil and deceit are always with us, and uh, we need to focus on Christ. But why? I really love the word why, where, what, how, which. They are golden words. They're, they cannot be used in other religions, doctrinally and philosophically. You know, socially they use that, but their religions and ideologies do not allow them to use it. Like socialism doesn't believe in freedom. It's a random philosophy. Nature is ruling. It's amazing. They, are the, they call themselves genius, but their doctrine says, that word doesn't make sense because everything happens by accident. Accident does have, doesn't have any management behind that. Conscience doesn't make sense. So, and the Islam doesn't allow that because it's a dictatorial religion. Quran says if the Prophet of Islam speaks, nobody has right to give his opinion. Quran chapter 33 verse 36. And the uh, New Age, Hinduism, Buddhism, as I mentioned to you, they are individualistic religion. You're God, you don't need the other God because you have everything. Just meditate on your own power and capacity. You don't need to ask me why, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, you have everything in you. So not many Hindus or New Age people are following that because they do not know their religions. And actually, when you speak to socialists, you see they are speaking 85% religious <laughs> without realizing that. And one day I was talking to an atheist, real atheist. He had some followers. My children were 
we were playing with his children. We knew each other. I asked him, do you love my children more than your children? He said, I was not expecting you to ask such a ridiculous question. I said, I'm sometimes ridiculous just you know, to know things a little bit <laughs> better. You just, you just, you know, call me dumb, please answer to my question. He said, of course I love my children more than yours. I said, where is that written in socialism? Socialism says that you're not the father of the children. They came, just nature brought them into this world. You, you haven't decided. You haven't decided for marriage. You haven't fallen in love with some because love doesn't make sense. Relationship doesn't make sense. You're just a machine. The machine of the nature. So it doesn't make sense. Your question doesn't make sense for you. If a socialist asks you a question, you need to say to him or her that question doesn't fit into socialism. You know, because question necessitates freedom, but freedom doesn't make sense in socialism. Freedom actually is the enemy. And the great authors like Marx and Engels, they, they wrote communism. Freedom is the product of capitalism. Capitalism is the product of Christianity. We use freedom to destroy freedom. It's logic and it's crazy that some university professors are saying that now. We need to use sometimes terrorism, they say, to establish ourselves in America, in Western countries. So these are the golden words. They are the words of Christ. Know the truth, the truth will set you free. He respects your autonomy. Truth is bigger than the world. You need to understand the truth in the context of the world. In other words, you need to compare. You know, truth is not only inside this building. He is the Lord of the universe. You need to walk with him. And I told you already, that's for your own benefit. Because if you know a little bit about other religions, you hug him so firmly. You know? So why? Why to focus on Christ? You need to have reason for that. The, the world has changed. Especially young people, listen to me carefully. You're going to have difficult time. I mean, you are all young, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, gospel doesn't know really the age. John was more than 90. He wrote some of the letters. Amazing. You know, fishermen became philosophers, thinkers. They were fishermen, simple men. But they prepared themselves. So you don't need to go and have a doctorate. You know, like me, you can really prepare yourself in six months to answer every question. I mean, most of you, some of you possibly do not want to wake up. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. It's just the flesh, you know, sometimes doesn't allow us. We are selfish. We do not. But we need to. We need to prepare ourselves. The world has changed. A lot of challenges there. You need to respond to them. But Really, when you see that you're touching their minds and hearts, it just gives you power. They change. So, why? We not only have... Um, let me give you a definition from Terboy first. Um, I just have, you know, uh, driven a definition from other sources. It's just a short one, but it's, it can be broader. Turmoil indicates to a state of disturbance, deceit, confusion, uncertainty, anything you can add there that brings loss to people, misguidance, misjudgment, indifference, ignorance, you know, strife, bloodshed. You see that, you know. We see in different countries, in Iran, you see in Russia and Ukraine and in other parts of the world. But the important thing is, in the time of turmoil and difficulties, 
We need to be more logical than fearful. You know, we have, not only Bible is saying that, but we have learned from history that you need to be rational in order to find your way out of it. And we learn from our, our parents, our guardians, our brothers and sisters who were living after us, calm down, it will be solved. You know, it's important for us because fear and anxiety, they are brothers with death. They are killers. They kill. And uh, in fear, we cannot master our mind wisely in order to be able to find the real cause for problem. We are confused, we will be unable to find it. A lot of South Africans are confused to find their way out. They need you. You're the salt and light of the world. Great master said this, and that doesn't happen just without preparing yourself to go to them. You won't be helpful. You need to prepare yourself. And you will be able also to pull yourself together to continue your daily life. I should not go there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. To pull yourself together to continue your daily life. Otherwise, you're going to terrify your children. They are going to be terrified. Your family, your society. That society in that situation needs the calmness and wisdom that only can help you. And also, that's the only time you'll be able to search for a long-lasting solution, for a permanent solution. Because short-term solutions are just painkiller. They cannot treat you. You need a permanent solution for yourself, for your grandchildren, for your grand-grandchildren. Just you need to think like Abraham. He had a big mind for future. He had a short mind. God met him and taught him gradually to have a big mind. That's what Jesus is for us. He sees actually us more than us. We see ourselves. We see ourselves little. But he says, you're the salt and light of the world. Oh, wow. So, we find the solution and then we help others touch their minds and hearts with those words, golden words, why, how, where. So they can also find the long-lasting solution and live with it. Why do we need long-lasting solution? Because that selfishness in us is always with us always with us. No matter how good you are, you still ignore. You, no matter how righteous you are, I mean, we have, I don't need to tell you, I mean, look at the Bible. <laughs> you know, the selfishness, even the disciples of Christ, prophets, look at their life in the, in the altar, look at the life of David, selfish guy. Even though he's heart is following God. He loves the Lord. But there is a selfishness in him. There is a selfishness in me. I cannot be a role model for you. You cannot be for me. Because we are selfish. It's always with us. We need a long-lasting solution. Something, somebody who can set, a, set the best value for us. That can become even universal for all people. And also, we have always seen the irrationalities of leaders in our country, it's around that. And sometimes I'm just shocked. Why this guy is a president? Why he is a minister? Oh my goodness. And just emotional people have voted for them, not logical people. Because democracy, you know, 50 plus one wins. So we need long-lasting solution. That solution is Jesus Christ. Why? That's so important. You need to find it. 
You need to invest more time. You're living in this world for Christ, not for your job, not for your children. Because if you do not live for Christ, you won't be able actually to help your children, your surrounding. That's why he said, love me more than others. If you put me in the first priority, you'll be a wonderful relational blessing person. So, he is, but you need to find the reason to touch the minds and hearts of people. If you really prepare yourself, you're going to lead every person to Christ. If that proud person gives you time. Because everybody loves the best. As I mentioned in my testimony, everybody. And you discover the best to them, even they are stiff neck, you can challenge them in a loving way. Come on, go home and think about it. It's going to touch their hearts and mind. Why? I'm going to give you some reason. They really changed my life. Um, there are a lot of reasons, but some reasons. Because Jesus is not an oppressor like the prophet of Islam, like Hitler like Stalin, like Putin, like some of our Western leaders, you know? They are not apparently oppressors, but ideologically they are, they are oppressing, putting pressure on people. Now it's not easy to speak about Christ in many universities in the Western countries. You don't. It's out of fashion. Socialism is the fashion now, you know? oppressing people because they do not know what logic is. They are not logical. But lo logic, rationality, without humility doesn't make sense. I should not go this further. I'm forgetting. Rationality needs humility. If you're not humble, you're not rational. He is humble and participative. He's not like Buddha or Brahman to say, you think just for yourself, you're everything. No, he's not. He says, you're the members of one body. You need each other. We all need each other. And that's why he became man to come and show us. Otherwise, he just could change the world with a little big bang. But he knows that the relationship is at the heart of God. It's the image of God. Trinity is actually for that, to prove to us that living in harmony is important and we need to have logic behind that. So he's the humble guy. Nobody is humble like him. Nobody is open to people like him. Nobody like him believes in the capacity of people. He is the only one, his book is the only one believes that people were created in the image of God. He is the only one, he believes in, in your capacity. Know the truth, the truth will set you free. He believes in your autonomy. He opens the door for the flow of idea. The ideas cross each other, as I mentioned to you. That's his value. Nobody's. No socialism, no Islam, no New Age, none of them. Only Jesus. It makes sense only in Jesus Christ. He wants to prepare his children, his followers, to know everything and to give reason for that. Because God is all-knowing God, it's hard to say He's okay if we don't know. It's hard to say that. He wants all of us to know. All-knowing God has created us in His own image. We need to know. So these qualities in Jesus changed the life in the Western countries. Family relationship with Jesus is the number one in the world. You cannot find like him. Nobody. If you know, please come and see me. 
I'm sorry, we will not have time, we will rush to go. <laughs> airport, but write to me, please. There is none. There are good people in the world. Buddha was a very nice man. He is not like Jesus. He even left his six months old baby. He was a prince. He left his wife. He said, your barrier for me. I'm leaving. I go. I'm trying to find that light in me, you know. And eventually he was not successful. Nobody is like him. Jesus is unique. Number one, that humble leadership created success in the Western countries. Western countries have chaos in the history. That's the time they didn't know Christ. They turned their back on Christ. But after Protestantism really became, you know, people could read the gospel and it took centuries. You know, colonialism is one of those ugliest things that Christians did, you know, so-called Christians in the Western countries. You know, um, that's not the heart of Christ. They did that, but gradually, slavery. It was Christians read their book and went and sat in front of the house of Lord in England, fought against that. English Christians helped, you know, people like Abraham Lincoln to fight against the slavery. It's the heart of the Bible. There is no any difference between king and servant, slave and king husband and wife, Jews and non-Jews. Why all are created in the image of God? His leadership is amazing. His leadership caused the businesses to be successful. His leadership caused the communism not to take place in the Western countries. Communism theory started in Germany, but Germany didn't become a communist. I mean, the Eastern ones just was occupied by Stalin and forced to follow communism because of the leadership of Christ. Capitalists in the West, they abused workers. They were calling themselves Christian. And sadly, many churches were standing behind the wealthy men to abuse workers. But they didn't know the gospel. Communism said, okay, so Christians are supporting capitalists. That means capitalism is the child of Christianity. And the people like Marx came and wrote his theory. You know, he stole actually some theory, you know, things from the Christianity, established his own religion. Like communism, everybody will live equally. That's Christ. That's in heaven. There will not be any difference between you. He stole from Christianity, put in an ungodly way, you know, said there is no God. There was chaos there, chaos there, but Christians woke up. Christians said, Christ said, under his leadership, everybody is the member of that body. Member of bodies, look after one another in, a, in an amazing way. Have you thought about it? You see the members of Adi? They are amazingly committed to one another. Not 99.99%, 100%. My buddy, I'm 69. In this last 69 years, for a single moment, I never saw my hand say to my leg, I hate you. <laughs> they love each other so much. Something happens to my finger, my eyes cry. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's only in the gospel. Likens our relationship to the relationship of body members. It's an amazing culture. It's the organizational culture. You're the organization of Christ. That's the dominating culture here. That culture was used by businessmen in the Western countries. After that abuse, 
Western countries improved in everything. China came to plagiarize to steal from the West. Japan follows Christ's leadership model. Singapore, South Korea, they are following Christ. They do not say that. Our scholars in the university do not say that. They just say they are following Western culture. No, 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 no. It's the culture of Jesus Christ. They are embarrassed to say that. They are, they are saying that also because we are not vocal. We do not have reason to say to them. So Christ's leadership is followed by all successful businesses in the world. All other religions or ideologies, they do not have work ethic. What does it mean that you are working and getting something in, in exchange for yourself? That doesn't make sense in Islam. Not in Shintoism, not in Hinduism. So forget about socialism. Socialism doesn't have ethic. Why? Because there, every, you, you don't have anything. Everything belongs to the Guru or God. But in the Bible, God says, even you're using oxen, don't close the mouth of that oxen. That oxen has the right to eat and even cares for animals. Now, environmentalists are the only one to care for the world, not you. Why? Because they don't know what is written in the Bible, and you and I were not vocal enough. That's his leadership. Emirates, Saudi Arabia, they are following the work ethic of Christianity. No work ethic in Islam. That's, that's Christ. That's why we need to focus on him. Even economically, socially, he's the role model best. <coughs> Christ is rational from the root to branches. The God of the Bible is the God of reason. We are the children of reason. Everything in Christ has a reason. Everything in other religions and ideologies doesn't have any reason. But they are saying that they have reason, we do not have reason. It's again because we are not vocal. We do not know. We don't have confidence. I just give you some example to you. First of all, you know, absolute love is reason for everything. From every angle you want to look at it. But some logical, you know. Paul says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. Paul is a mighty man. He understands Christ very well. He's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing man to manifest education, reason. He's a wonderful philosopher. He speaks with reason. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If your root is not holy, can you call yourself holy, righteous? It's impossible. If you're not planted on a good root, can you claim that you're a good person? It's impossible. If your root is deceiving, you are a deceiver. If your root is bloodthirsty, if Allah thirsts for blood, no matter how much a Muslim loves peace, if that Muslim follows that God, he or she must get involved in bloodshed. That's your leader. That's your top, you know, leader that you have reverence toward that leader. Root is so important. Your role model is so important. Islam is a religion of peace. That is not Islam. I don't doubt you Muslim love peace, but you're not going to get it because your root is bloodthirsty. Your root says in the Quran, kill your non-Muslim relatives and friends. Quran chapter 9 verse 123. 
Quran chapter 9 even teaches young little babies, do not follow the guardianship of your father. If he is a Muslim, but he is not a radical Muslim. He is not a committed Muslim. Quran chapter 9 verse 23. Quran, as I mentioned to you, says Allah is the best of deceivers. Wallahu khairul makreen in Arabic. Maybe some of you know that. Arabic. Makreen means deceivers. Khairul, the best. Wallah, that means and Allah. Khairul makreen, the best of deceivers. New, new translation say he's the best of planners. Just, just to deceive the verse. But every Muslim knows that word. Even you don't know the no Arabic, but the words have come into your language if you're a Muslim. Indonesian know that. Iranian know. Everybody, every Muslim knows that. The the meaning of that phrase. If your root is deceiver, you cannot be a righteous person, a loving person. Root is important. That's the logic of Jesus Christ shines. In other words, imperfection does not lead to perfection. You know, your root must be perfect. That's all other religions, all other religions. All those people who do not believe in salvation in this world, no matter Christians, or others. Those people who do not believe that salvation must take place in your life on earth, their religion and belief is imperfect and they believe in the imperfection of people and they believe that that imperfection will take them to perfection. My goodness, let me give you an example. Every religious follower you know, religion followers know that there are two kinds of kingdom in the world, bad and good, dark or light, you know, yin and yang. Suppose here there is a circle, this is the kingdom of Satan, and this is the kingdom of God. When you are not saved, you are here. Even though you do not like it, but you're here because there's no a third one. You either are in the kingdom of God or Satan. But when you are here, can you do a righteous thing in order to please God? Absolutely not. Why? Because he wants you, not your deed. That first. Second, if you talk to your king, Satan, well, I have been with you 30, 20, or 50 years. I now decided to be righteous after this. You know what will he say to you? You're kidding me. <laughs> I don't believe in righteousness. You don't know that? I'm the enemy of holiness and righteousness. You're in my bondage. You're chained here. You're chained. Unless the mightier than Satan comes and takes you and puts you here. You're now in the kingdom of righteous. You can do good deeds because your root is righteousness. Let me give you another example. I can speak to you 10 days here, but I pray that I finish on time. I don't make my brother Gustav nervous. <laughs> I was just speaking like this in a seminar years ago in Australia, in Perth. There was a question time. A couple traditional Christians were invited there by their friend. He asked me, sir, so you're denying the good deeds, actions in this world, and there, there's no worth in them. I said, no, sir, socially they are good but they will not convince God. God doesn't need your work. Let me give you an example to you, sir. Are you married? He said, yeah. Wife was sitting by him. Do you have any children? He said, yes. I said, suppose one of your children has run away, sir. You don't know where he or she is. 
and you have been praying and crying and I saw he started to cry. I thought maybe because of my English I offended him. <laughs> I just really thought, I said, I'm sorry sir, did I say something to offend you? The friend said, no, his son has run away. They don't know where he is. Oh, I got goosebumps, honestly. I said, wow, God is here. He is going to manifest himself now. I waited, he cried a little bit, and I said to him, sir, I'm really sorry, ma'am, it's really hard for mothers. But, but it's amazing, God is not allowing me to only give reason, but a living reason, a practical reason. Sir, you're in pain, ma'am, you're in pain. You have given your hope, you know, up. But one day, you're sitting in the room, you see somebody is knocking your door. You open the door and you see your child. What will you do? And he cried again. He said, I'll jump and hug him and bring him in. I said, that's very nice, sir, but you shouldn't do that. You should do exactly what you expect your God to do to you. You need to tell your son, son, stay there. I'm going to measure your good deeds and bad deeds. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, I'll get you in. And he said, no, no, I'll bring him in. I said, that's my God, sir. That's my God. He doesn't need my work, sir. He wants me, sir. You need to be saved now, sir. You need to ask God to hug you now, to take you in, into his kingdom now. That's my Lord Jesus. Nobody speaks like him. Nobody teaches like him. Nobody works like him. Nobody, nobody teaches like him. All of them says imperfection leads to perfection. Come on, come on. That's why he should be your role model. He says, unless you're the child of peace, unless you follow the prince of peace, you won't be a peacemaking person. You won't, you won't be able to love peace. You see, logical. He is logical from the root to the branches. He needs to be your role model. I mean, you need him to be your role model. That's why we need to focus on him. In Jesus, all are equal. I mentioned to you already. All are equal because everybody is created in the image of, image of God. It's amazing. Muslims call Jews animals, Christians animals in the Quran. And they also claim that they're following the same grandpa, Abraham. I'm a grandpa. It really breaks my heart if one of my set of my grandchildren say to the other one, they're animals. In other words, grandpa produced animals. Socially, it's heartbreaking. Doesn't make sense, really. But the Bible is teaching you, everybody is made in the image of God. That image doesn't focus on the color. Oh, this is my black follower. That's my white follower, yellow follower. This is the big one, that's the tall one, that's the skinny one, that's the ugly one. You're crowned in Christ. There's no difference in Christ. He brings all nation together. Now, it's a reality, we can see that here. But that reality is there too. All from all nations will come in front of his throne to glorify him. That's Christ only. All are equal. But equality is just a member of one body. You see my fingers? They are not like one another. They are different. But they have the equal right. 
they complement each other. Nobody is exactly similar to the other one. It's amazing that even they say twins do not have the same fingerprint. Their fingerprints are, but they are, they have equal rights. We are different. One of us, some of us external, some of us introverted, some of us dancing. My wife hates to dance. I'm a dancer. <laughs> you know, I embarrass her sometimes. But we complement each other in the Lord. We are equal in His eyes. She is not greater than me, I'm not greater than her. That's Christ. Only in Christ that makes sense. Whereas Islam is a cultist religion. New Age is a cultist religion. Socialism is a cultist religion. Socialism doesn't have any value for humanity. If only you think like leader, you're accepted. That in Islam is the same. Allah has already taught for you. Muhammad has already decided for you. You don't need to decide. That's not Christ. You are carrying the image of God. I have been so successful in my talk to people. Logically touch their minds and hearts and say to them that you have power in yourself. If you rely on your conscience, on your mind, on your heart, you will be able to distinguish the difference between truth and false. People have that. And that respect only comes from Christ that is able to unite with, um, with each other in a logical way. You can have reason. You have reason why you need each other, why you need to be sacrificial toward one another. Um, in Jesus, people are persuadable. You know, I, I already told you that doesn't make sense in socialism. Islam doesn't allow that. You don't need to be persuaded. You just blindly follow. Islam means submission in Arabic. Submit yourself. That's it. But Jesus doesn't want submission blindly. Know the truth. The reason he revealed himself to us for us to know him, as I mentioned to you in the first session. That's why he says, go to people and teach them. If people are not teachable, why should you go to them? He knows that. They are teachable. They are created in my image. I love them to understand. You can make disciples of them. They can understand. They have conscience, mind, and heart. They can understand the best. They can follow the cause for problems, the root um, you know, problem and they can find the solution, they can uproot the causes of disharmony and live in harmony with each other, trust in one another, have collaboration with each other. You know the one of the amazing principles in Christ? There is no win-lose principle, always is win, Win! Everybody must win! Everybody must be heavenly! Everybody needs to be heavenly, Jesus said. That doesn't make sense in any other religion and ideology. No matter who you are, you are my enemy, I need to help you to wake up. You know, in your country some years ago, I was speaking in a uh, in a church, an imam from the neighboring um, mosque came in and he attacked me. Some people jumped up and protected me and didn't allow him to punch me. And uh, so I asked the brothers who were protecting me, I said, could you please a little bit move aside? I just want to talk to this gentleman kindly asked his name, he said Muhammad. His name was Muhammad. I said, Mr. Muhammad, in a 
few minutes, I'll come to you to punch me as much as you want. But I need to ask you a couple of questions. Please answer the questions in front of the people. And then I will try my best to stay faithful and come to you so you can punch me. My first question is, sir, they are not difficult question, easy question. Don't you believe that Islam is the is a perfect religion? Is the perfect religion? He said, yes. Don't you believe, sir, second question, don't you believe, sir, that a perfect religion should have perfect wisdom? He paused a little bit. He said, yes, I think so. I said, sir, I want to make sure in front of these people that you said you're following a perfect religion with perfect wisdom. Am I correct, sir? He said, yes. I said, perfect wisdom doesn't need punch, sir. Perfect wisdom answers every question with logic, with calmness, with peace. Every criticism, every aggressive attitude has solution in a perfect religion, sir. I just wanted to tell you, sir, you want to prove to these people that you're not following a perfect religion. Please come and punch me. And he apologized me in front of people. I said, your apology is accepted, sir. But I haven't finished my word with you. Can we have communication with each other? So I gave my email to him. He gave his email to me. And after six months, he gave his heart to the Lord. Wow. I learned this from Jesus Christ. You care for the life of your enemy too. But if you do not touch the heart and mind of them, you're not going to be successful. They are persuadable. You just need to prepare yourself to touch their hearts. One Australian said to me, Christianity is rubbish. Handsome, tall, apparently educated man. He didn't think I was a follower of Christ because this face doesn't show that. <laughs> I said, really, you believe that? He said, yes, I do. I said, then I'm in desperate need of your help. He said, why? I said, I'm carrying that rubbish in my heart. <laughs> but I don't like to carry rubbish in my heart, sir. And I'm glad you discovered that, sir. And I desperately need your help. I beg your help to help me to get rid of it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were a Christian. I said, that's okay, sir. Honestly, I'm happy that the communication is starting between you and me. I need your help. Please, you have time, help me. He said, how can I help you? I said, let me ask you a couple of questions. They are not difficult questions, again. The gospel says, love your spouse as yourself and your, enemy, um, your neighbor as yourself. Could you please tell me which part of this is rubbish? He said, no, they look good. I said, sir, according to the gospel, church is the organization of Christ. In that organization, it says, the greatest among you should be the servant of all. It gives authority and autonomy to people, responsibility to people to even run the life of leader. I am the decision maker. I appoint you to follow my principles, my set principle. Now, sir, I am coming from a society that dictatorship not only is social, but it is godly. One time only, I was a good student. I was trying really to pass my exam with good marks. I was very busy. My father didn't understand me. He just wanted me to 
work can bring money for him. But I really love to be uneducated, trying my best. It's my exams day. My father is working in the farm. He comes to the road and says to me, would you like me to build the toilet here for you too? He was mocking me. I just in a humble way said, but dad, I used the word but he was very close to kill me. I said, that's the dictatorship in my country and in most Islamic countries, unfortunately, sir. But sir, I'm a lecturer in the university. In that time I was teaching in the university. And it is taught in the university that the most successful business is when the leader doesn't see him or herself greater than others. That's in the gospel, sir. What is, which part of this is rubbish when gospel says the greatest among you should be the servant of all? Could you please tell me? He said to me, that's written in the gospel. I said, didn't you know, sir, that was written in the gospel? He said, I haven't read the gospel. I said, sir, that breaks my heart. Apparently, you are an educated person. You're rubbish in gospel, sir, without reading that gospel. Sir, that's not even the culture of the West. We have great people like Plato, like Aristotle, and others. Aristotle says, if you want to reject the philosophy, you need to know that philosophy to reject it. If you want to be a philosopher, you need to know philosophy. That's your culture, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed how Western countries have changed for bad, sir. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I possibly need to read the gospel. I said, yes, sir, this is one for you. <laughs> read it. You know, people are persuadable. We need to touch their hearts. We need. Oh, how we are going to time? I'm okay? Okay. Um, you know, freedom in Jesus has confidence and courage. When you are here in the kingdom of God, when the mighty creator of the universe is with you, nobody is above him, he is your chief commander, he is your leader, that carries a lot of confidence, a lot of courage. So the leadership, I told you, your root is important. That brings confidence in you. If you do not have courage, please read the gospel again. Please do that. Because if you fall in love with someone, love is very vocal. Love is not quiet. You have a um, friend have fallen in love with him or her, you go and talk. You want to marry, you go, go talk. You have a child, you talk. You have grandchildren, you talk. Grandchildren are amazing, <laughs> really amazing. I always talk about them, my wife, oh wow. <laughs> love talks, naturally. Love talks. You need to live that natural loving life in love and talk. If you do not talk, please read the gospel again. You don't know what love means in Christ. That's why you're not talking. You need to prepare. You don't need to be a scholar to talk. That love speaks through your body language even. Love is amazing in Christ. So be courageous. He is the only one who gives courage to you. He said, take courage, I have overcome the world. John chapter 19, 16, verse 33. Take courage. Love has courage. Our capacity decreases when we replace Christ with others. We lose everything. We run to chaos. Consciously and unconsciously. We become the center of our own life. And even it's so shocking to me to find some doctrine from Christians in Western countries, especially in America. Oh, faithful Christians will not be persecuted at all. 
That's crazy. I, I don't know I'm going to offend you or not. I hope none of you think like this. Faithful Christians get persecuted that what my Lord came face to face with it. You know, easy life helps us to create easy doctrine for us, to convince, to deceive ourselves. We lose our capacity. Jesus wants us to be like God. But we, if we leave him, we replace him, we just, you know, uh, put ourselves in the circle of our limited, irrational image, self-centered image. Our morality has changed. And now you are reading, you are hearing what's happening in the Western world. Once what's homosexuality is now gender and it's going to continue. It doesn't have end. It's going to take us to chaos. Let me give you reasons. It just recently happened to me. If any homosexual is here, please bear with me. Recently I was talking, I mean, a couple of months ago, in Melbourne, in Australia. It, evening I was talking, I went back um, to, uh, by the way, if, if you, if you need my um, notes, you can get from from uh, brother brother Gustav. I was talking somewhere else in the evening, so I went. I was staying with the family. The family's son was a youth group pastor. He had a meeting in his house, and there was a homosexual boy there. They had invited him there, so he he asked me, urged me to join their meeting. So I joined there, I was quiet, but in question time they started to ask questions from me. And he asked me how Islam deals with homosexuality. I said kills without judgment. It's the responsibility of Muslims to kill homosexuals. Even though the heaven of Islam is just homosexual. <laughs> It's just amazing. If you read Islamic <coughs> heaven, it just you get shocked. You know? There's a there's a door for homosexuality there too. Like young, lustrous boys like Pearl. They are in the Quran. Anyhow, um, he asked the second question, what do you think as a Christian? You know, what is my place there? I said, the Bible says homosexuality is sin, but please allow me to give you a reason for that. And I'm not going to give you a spiritual reason. I know that it's not easy for people who do not know the God of the Bible to align themselves with spiritual reason, but I'm going to give you a scientific reason that if we really do not have a set of standards set by someone who is better than us, we are going to lead our life to chaos. Let me give you an example I, I told him. A scientific, a mathematical example I gave him. Mathematics is very, very clear. And before that I asked him, do you believe in boundaries? He said, what do you mean? He said, let me give you an example. You need to give example to people. Example helps. We were sitting in the living room. I said, what do you call this room? He said, living room. I said, okay, it's not a toilet. So you know this is a living room, not a toilet. If you use it at the toilet, it's going to create chaos. <laughs> so he understood that there is a boundary. I said, sir, boundaries are so beautiful so many times. If it is set by someone who is not selfish like me, like you. By the way, you believe that you're selfish, selfish and sometimes you can ignore others. So I helped him to understand it. Yeah, I'm selfish. Okay, I said, sir, if we do not follow God in the Bible, there are many gods, I'm not talking about other gods, I don't believe them they are God, sir. I believe that God in the Bible is the true God and Jesus 
is the supreme person to set boundaries for us. But if we replace Jesus with our own autonomy and choice, we are going to lead people to chaos. Let me give you an example from mathematics. This is from statistics, it's called factorial. I always loved mathematics, and also mathematics goes with philosophy. You need to give example to people. I said, suppose, sir, you and I want to create a community. You and I. Each one of us have one choice, one freedom, we are free. You're autonomy, autonomous, I am. Two people are coming together, creating a community. How many chances are there for us to betray each other? To become disloyal to one another, or even to, to be good with each other, without any role model? Because we are the role model for ourselves. He said two. I said, okay, we get the third friend, we become three now. How many choices are there for us to betray each other? He said, three. I said, no, sir, it's not three anymore. It's six, sir. Let me give this example to you, then it will not be easy for me to give example in other ones. There are already three individual choices. And then I unite with her against her, becomes four. She unites with him against me, becomes five. I unite with him against her, becomes six. In statistic, this is the formula. Three time two people, time option. What each one has one option, becomes six. Four. Four, four, time three, time two, time one, becomes 24. Four people can betray each other in 24 ways. Five, 120. I'm a family of five, but now I'm more than that. I have grandchildren. Six, 720. 7 over 5,000, but I'm staying in 5,000 to calculate it easily. 8, 40,000. 8 people, if they do not rely on God, there are 40,000 ways for them to deceive each other. 9, 360,000. 10, 3 million, 600,000 way. People can deceive each other. That's science. This is not theory. That's the reality. You know, groups come together against the other one. It's amazing. 10 people can deceive each other in 3 million, 600,000 way. You better believe in Christ. Because in Christ, you're dead to yourself. He is living in you. He's a standard. Why he lives in you? Because he is absolutely loving. He doesn't have selfishness. He is absolutely just. He is absolutely righteous. He deserves to set the boundary for us, not us. We create chaos. 10 people, 3 million, 600,000. How many people are here? Word that cannot, you know, those numbers cannot describe. You cannot say. They are huge. That's the scientific reason, sir, for me. Let me give you a social reason. And after that, if you're happy, I give you a spiritual reason. Socially, sir, there is no law. People are dis deciding now, that's the case in the Western countries, they are following socialism, no law. Okay, you're saying that I want to marry a man. There is no set of law, sir, we need to accept that. And then there is somebody saying that I need to marry my dog. Yeah, a professor in Sweden. For for decades, I've been fighting 
I need to get married with my female dog. I read actually once or twice, there is a prince somewhere in Africa. Princess, I want to get married with my dog. I need marriage certificate. No, sir, because there is no set of boundary for morality, they have a right to get their certificate. So, sir, you see, it's not ending, it's coming. The day after we are walking in the streets of Melbourne, we see everybody is walking with his bride dog or monkey or bride groom of dog and monkey in the streets. It's okay if people are walking with their dogs, but the story doesn't finish there. I'm, I'm trying to be here frank to you. Maybe you don't like to hear this. It's okay. Sir, so, animals, everybody know, cannot align themselves with ethic. If animal desires for a sexual relationship in the street, the partner needs to make himself or herself ready. Because they believe we are all from the same species, we need to follow the same principle. Would you like, sir, to see my society, your society like that? I'm walking with my children, with my grandchildren, that everybody is sleeping somewhere and they are doing something, sir. And he put his head here. That's what he did. You're right. I said, sir, I'm not saying that you're not homosexual. I think everybody is homosexual. That corruption, that selfishness in me, in everybody, it just, you know, has sometimes power or less power. In you, femininity has come there. So I'm not saying that you're sick or you're sinning. I'm trying in this stage to talk to you logically, sir. Sir, I really love to have 20 wives, 10 wives. My wife maybe loves to have 50 husbands, sir. What is wrong with her? What is wrong with me, sir? Because I want to live in harmony in the society, sir, I need to give up, sir. You need to give up, sir. You need to suffer. I don't call it suffer, sir, because I haven't given you a spiritual reason yet. But you take it just as a suffer. You need to suffer, sir, for the harmony of the society, for the well-being of society. I need to give up. But, sir, boundary set by a righteous person makes you a righteous person, makes you a lawful person. You will be able to abide yourself with the law for the benefit of all, sir, not for your selfishness, not only for your individuality. If you replace Christ, you see where it takes us? And it's taking. Who is responsible for this? Who is going to fix this? You and I. Jesus says you're the salt of the world. You're the social, ethical, political, spiritual salt of the world. You need to open the minds and hearts of people not to take us to chaos. He should be a role model. Um, it's ungodliness. We created ungodliness. We, we say this kind of life is ungodliness. It's sin. You know, lawless. It's a deep problem in the human heart. But deeper problems always need deeper remedies. We know that. Painkiller is just for a few hours for us. We need really to, to find someone, you know, to give us the best remedy, the treatment. Christ is the only one to uproot that ungodliness through his absolute values, 
He is absolutely loving. He is the solution for unloving attitudes. He is just solution for injustice. He is the source of wisdom, solution for selfishness in every way. And that, that I gave you an example in my first talk that Matthew 12, 18 to 21, he's reciting Isaiah chapter 42, that he came to take justice to victory in every way. In this world, make, the, make it relevant to our life in this world. Salvation is the reality of this world. It's not the reality of that world. Unity, salvation means unity with the best one. Unity is the reality of this world. You get united here. You don't fall in love with a girl or a man and say, yes, we are ready for marriage, but we'll marry in the life after. You don't say that. Because unity is the reality of this life. God has established that principle for us. We need to unite with God here. I so often ask more than simple question, isn't that good to be saved here? They love it. It's good to be. Isn't it good to be saved here rather than leaving it for the life after? You never, never want to delay your help to your loving ones. If your child asks you, Mom and Dad, I'm desperate, help me now. Do you say, I'll, I'll, I'll help you in the life after? No, you jump and help your child. You sacrifice your life for your child here. The religions are baseless. They are living it for the life after. Allah said, oh, maybe you'll be saved. Or Hinduism, maybe you're going to be a rich white man. Come on. Salvation should happen here. That's what Jesus said. Give your hand to me. I take you from the kingdom of Satan. Put you here so you can become the apple of my eyes. That's nice. That's good. Unity is good. You unite with God here. He crushes the enemy. He's, he's, he's the best leader. He, he reveals the enemy to you first. And then says, says to you, please allow me to overthrow him in your heart so I can come and sit there. That's what he did. That's why I put my trust in him. Because Muhammad was unable to do that. Buddha, not able to do that. Others, unable to do that. Only Jesus. So I put my trust in him. And after that, you see how I am talking. He enlarged my eyes, my vision, to see, to talk to people, to take a risk, to sacrifice. I was a lecturer, I was kicked out from the university because of my faith in Christ. I was making $110 per hour. And after that, I rushed and got a job, cleaning job. And then God opened the door for me to the world. I lived by faith. I trusted him. You know, I'm not saying that I'm a hero. No, I, mean, I should do that. Love necessitates to do that. You know, Paul was not a crazy man to take his life and travel here and there. And even he didn't have the time to have a spouse. <laughs> All others had their spouse and said, well, they have, but he didn't have that, you know. First of all, they were all under persecution, running, you know, here and there, but he loved the Lord, you know. You need to sacrifice, you know. My conscience was not allowing me to live comfortable, you know. You have to do something. Several times I was rescued from certain deaths, you know, in Europe and in America. You know, but I believe in his sovereignty. He is sovereign God. He has a time for me. If that time hasn't come, even the entire armies of the world come together, they won't be able to kill me. You know, you know, as I mentioned to you, again, love has its own logic. When my children, my grandchildren are in 
are in are in problem. It would be crazy if I ignore them. I put my life there, you know. I still say, Lord, I'm your follower, your sovereign God, but please take my life first so I do not see the death of my children and beloved ones. You know, it's just you know in us. So we need to we need to sacrifice, and that's. That vision is coming from Christ. He's touching us. He is helping us to understand the meanings, the, the things, his meanings of his principle, his advices, his teaching. To live a peaceful life, to have peace in ourselves and enjoy our life in peace. So let us allow Christ to become our identity, my brothers and sisters. Please do that. It's not easy. It's not easy when you have a house, you have insurance, you have a car, or you are struggling. It's not easy. But just think about that. You know, He is the source of absolute love. He proved His love to me. His, he gave His love, life for me. Love necessitates sacrifice too. If I am genuine, I need to be ready also to give my life for that. So let him become our identity. We are going to rejoice and we, our community is going to be beautiful and we are going to shine like his light. Thank you so much again for your patience listening to me. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, friends, we would love to open the floor for questions for Daniel. Um, so, uh, anybody, please, uh, Daniel would love to, to hear from you. There's over there. Hi, Daniel. I'm Anthony. Um, I would just want like to find out uh, what would your definition or meaning be freedom in Christ? Um, freedom in Christ is to be free from the master of every lawlessness, every inhuman thing. And uh, to respect the freedom of others, to open the space for others, to come to have opportunity, increase their capacity for the same thing. So that's the freedom. In other words, freedom is the absolute freedom in Christ. Um, to shine over everybody. We are the examples of that freedom to shine among other people. Um, as I mentioned, Christ is God. He can change the world with a little big bang. But he chose the human agent to manifest that example. That's why he came himself to this world. He didn't need to come to this world. He came to this world to show the example of heaven, the example of freedom from heaven. And it was not easy for his disciples to digest that. Gradually he gave them reason. And especially after his resurrection, their eyes were open fully you know so um, i just want to say to you that's the freedom but that freedom needs examples to manifest that he came himself as an example of freedom to manifest himself to his disciples and gradually open their eyes and he wants us to be used as his examples now he said go and teach people you need to really, each one of you should be involved in that going ministry, either supporting that ministry, and, uh, but there's no any excuse for you just to, to pay money to them to do that, but you can do that in your neighborhood and in your house and other. 
So that is the freedom I mentioned to you. It's an absolute freedom, but that absolute freedom must be manifested by you and I and all of us. Thank you. Look, so I just want to ask you, there is something that's really come through today is that you've got this amazing view of, amazing image of God. You will use the word amazing. Would it be possible for you to pray for us that we can have our eyes opened also to see what you see? Would it be... Almighty God, I praise your name that you know everything. You're all-knowing God. You're almighty. You are everywhere. You are here with us. Now you are here with us. And you love to open the eyes of everybody and our eyes to respond to questions in a constructive way, in a building creative way. Almighty God, I just ask you now glorious God, to touch the mind and the heart of every one of us here, Almighty God. Anoint us, open the heaven, pour out that heavenly oil on us and touch each one of us, glorious God. Enlarge our vision, Almighty God, to understand you deeply, your beauty, Almighty God. Not only that, to be able to manifest it, to be able to describe it, we praise your name for your faithfulness. We praise your heart that you love your children to know and to reveal your beauty. You, you said ask, you'll be given. So that's our motivation to ask you. I lift up my brothers and sisters to your throne of grace, glorious God. Touch each one of them. Empower them to live for you, to manifest your love to everyone around them, either those who agree with them or those who do not agree with them. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, okay. uh, many Western missions organizations have it as a strategy for reaching Muslims not to lead individuals to Christ, but wait until the whole family is ready. And I just wanted to ask, what's your opinion about that? The whole what? I didn't know. The whole family. The whole family. Yeah. Now, um, it's not easy to work with them, with Muslims as a group. Muslims, the, the main thing in Islam is the fear. Muslims were taught from the beginning that they need to lose everything but keep Islam. So they do not dare to speak in front of each other in favor of Christianity or, or any other things other than Islam. They are afraid from each other, you know. Therefore, you need to invest on evangelism on one-on-one -on -one, uh, because they have some freedom there. You can challenge them. They can listen to your challenges, but in a group it's difficult. Please don't do that because experiences have shown that. And I have experienced that myself. You know, I was even unable to tell my wife, I told you. Why? Because the ground was not ready. You need to, you need to help. You need to lead that person who is able and he, she, or he or she is going to make a big difference in the family. You know, and uh, so that's always try one on one, unless they are very close friend with each other and they are open to one another. Sometimes it happens. You know, they have already spoken to one another. We don't see that much in Islam. Let us try something else. So in that in that situation, you can talk to them. So for family, just ladies to ladies and men to men, Islamic families like that. You have to because the culture is different for them. So you need to build friendship with your um, own kind. Thank you very much indeed. I listened to you in Westville a number of years ago, quite a number of years ago, and uh, I've learned a lot today as well. I just wanted to ask you, when I'm uh, trying to reach out to Muslim people. The question is, what about the Trinity? You believe in three gods. How do you answer it? I know how I answer it and I feel it's clumsy, but I'd like to hear what you would say. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Um, my response is to them, if you do not have God, you won't have Trinity. So let us start from God, not Trinity. Trinity comes after that you know who God is. And uh, some of them rush into that, and I promise them that I am not going to ignore that. Just allow me to start from God. And uh, I say, I ask them, do you believe God is Almighty? Muslims believe that. Islam, you know, the Quran is just the oral tradition, 85% of oral tradition from traditional Jews and Christians. Because the Prophet of Islam went to a church for about 30 years. Islamic started exactly like Jehovah's Witnesses and or more. Culturally, it make, made a lot of difference because culturally, fighting with each other, tribal fighting and killing was just very popular. It became popular in Islam. Everybody should disappear and Islam should take over. So God, they, they understand this, that God is almighty, God is all-knowing, God is everywhere. So God is almighty, yes. What does it mean? That means God is able to do everything in his power. Okay. Now, you say also God is everywhere. The Islamic doctrine is funny. It says God is unknown, but he is everywhere. If he's everywhere, everybody should know him. You know? So, God is everywhere. So you're saying that God is mighty and he's everywhere. So he's here now. I am in South Africa, talking to my wife, she says, he's here too. Oh wow. Talking to the friend, a, a group talk. From Europe, from America, from Australia, from South Africa, we are a bunch of Christians talking to each other. I say God is here, she says God is here, he says God is here. Mighty God can reveal himself simultaneously everywhere. So one God can show himself in millions way. I mean, the tree is so simple <laughs> compared to millions, you know? So God reveals himself. You said he is mighty, he reveals himself. In the Quran is written, he revealed himself like a fire to Moses. I mean, what is wrong with him to reveal himself like a human kind? What is wrong? There's no wrong. He's mighty. And he's everywhere too, you're saying that. So he, if he's everywhere, he has that capacity to reveal himself. One person revealing himself in millions of ways, you, call, you do not call there are millions of gods. It's one God. And I, you know, sometimes it just happens in our own life. You know, it's not in our daily life. You see, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a tree. No, just the same person. Has different responsibility. That means Trinity. Trinity doesn't mean three gods. Bible never says that there are three gods or many gods. God is one. New Testament says, Old Testament says. So, this is, sir, you're saying that God is three, it is blasphemous actually in the Bible. You don't believe God is more than one, but one God can reveal himself to me and say, hey, you don't have a mom. I'm like your mom. Even your, if you have a mom and she leaves you, I won't leave you. That's what Isaiah says. You know, the, and so he says, I'm your good mom. I'm your dad, you know. You know, I can take the sacrifice for you. I mean, you see, I'm ready if my children really are face to face with, I am the first person, person to take a step and say, I'm, go, I'm ready to carry out that penalty. And I wish they give that penalty to me so my child becomes free. It's the heart of love, you know, loving, loving, um, you know, heart of God. So it's not three God, it's logically, it's one God he just, because of me, because of my need, he said, look, I'm, a, I'm called your father because I just want all walls to disappear between you and me. So we have intimate relationship with you. Unfortunately, you decided bad in your life. You're caught up with chain. I need to pay to bring you out of that chain. Because God 
is even a just God towards Satan. He cannot be in, you know, unjust towards Satan. Satan, right from the beginning, God said, don't go with Satan, you'll die. So it's the right of Satan to have dead people in his kingdom. It is right, because you have freedom to go and live with Satan. And Satan has freedom also to win, you know, to, to, to deceive you and to chain you. So God needs to approach to it logically. You cannot save yourself because you're in the bondage. Satan comes and said to me, where is your, said to him, where is your justice? You said at the beginning, they will die, they will be mine. Why are you taking them without giving any price, penalty for that? It's like, you know, we have seen actually, I have read the stories that a judge's daughter in America was, was caught in a high speed and she was taken to the court and his dad, dad was the judge there. And so dad, dad judged her, she had to pay penalty, she was underage, and dad take it, clock, how do you call it, and went and sat with the daughter to the, you know, um, ass assistant judge said, I'm going to pay for her. I mean, it's, it, if it is easy for me to do that, it's much easier for God to do that. He said, I'll come and save you. He saved me. Have you ever helped your children and said, okay, I've finished my responsibility, goodbye? No, you're always there for your children. That's Him, Holy Spirit, is always with us till the end of the world. I will be with you, I will enlarge your vision, I will convict your heart, I will punish you, I will bless you, so you become a mature person, ready for crown. Daniel, Iran is a mixture, talking about the country of nation, many different ethnic groups there. I have a question for you. Are you a Zeri background? My mom is a Zeri. My dad is Persian or Mid. So I think okay. he is Mid because he ruled in the northern part of Iran. Oh, amazing, amazing. The other question is, what is God doing amongst the various groups, the minorities, so many different language groups there? Is there an outpouring of God's Spirit nationwide? Yeah, there are 420 ethnic groups in Iran. They speak their own dialect and uh, most of the time do not understand each other. But nowadays, most people understand Farsi, that's the educational language, especially young people. My mom did, could, was unable to speak Farsi. She was just able to speak Turkish, Azari. So we learned Azari from her, from childhood. But now they understand, because Farsi is the educational language, so many of them, especially young people, can watch you know, YouTube and DVDs and they understand from there. And the evangelism you are doing in Farsi, it's amazing, many of them also understand English now. Even though at the beginning Ayatollah Khomeini was just hostile toward Europeans and especially American, and erased the language in English actually from the curriculum in their school. But the Iranians always loved, you know, Western style of life. And so many of them also speak English. So there's no dif difficulty now, even, you know, um, I just, in my family, there are illiterate people and I see they can speak Farsi. They even learn the Farsi by listening a lot to TV and the satellite TVs and others. Daniel, this has been great. Thank you so much. I wondered if you could just say a few words about the lot of the average Christian in Iran today. Is it is it is is he secret about it, or can he declare it? Um, your life has been obviously at, at risk. Are, are, are there people facing risk today? Do you have to be underground? If you could just say a few words. 
um, Iran, they, they, they killed a lot of people, but 11 pastors were killed until, until 10 years ago. And uh, after that, many of them are in prison and persecuted. As all churches were closed, all churches were active. Only the churches in, in other languages like Assyrian and Armenian languages, they are open, but they are forbidden to get involved in evangelism. So they don't evangelize. So after that, all Farsi speaking churches, most of them were ex-Muslims, they went underground. The, the buildings were closed by government. And uh, so after that, everything has become secret, but I don't know the exact number. And uh, there are some popular Christian organization who have been in research, you know, for a statistic in all other countries. They say that the ex-Muslims in Iran now are between a million and seven in the last 40 years. Uh, I don't know exactly the number. They are all underground. I have examples. I have traveled most of the European countries, everywhere I have gone in America. There are huge Iranian churches, mostly ex-Muslims. Um, so they have come from Islamic background. And I also, once a month, sometimes twice, I speak in a live TV, and uh, it's just, you know, they called. And I, a couple of months ago, I was speaking actually in Los Angeles. A sister actually called from my own estate back in Iran. She said to me that the way you're speaking, it's, it has brought the Tower of Islam down and opened the eyes of many. Actually, I am here with this family of six. We listened to your talk. Now all six gave their heart to the Lord. So people are disillusioned with Islam and they are ready, they are searching, they need reason. I am giving them reason, not only their spiritual reason, but social reason that it is good for your economy, for your family and others. And they are discovering why there is persecution in Iran, no freedom in Iran. One last question there in the back. I'm going to go. My question is uh, directed. I uh, uh, just wanted to make a comment on uh, the relationship between salvation and social change. Uh, you did mention about uh, how. The, the European bloc has been changed due to uh, reformation. I'm a bit confused because the church in Africa has been here for quite a long time, yet I don't see much change in the society, in the spheres of society, in terms of the gospel bringing transformation there. We have got dictatorship and corruption. What is the link between salvation the relationship between salvation and social change. Um, I gave an example about the root, that we are planted on the root. I mean, logically, if you have a root, you have branches, you bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, that body of that tree is just good for fire. This is a logical thing that Jesus gave to us. We invest our lives, you know, I love really fruit trees. I plant a lot of fruit trees in my yard. If they do not bear fruit, I don't need them. You know, it's, this is the logical thing. In Christ, when you're planted there, you need to give that example. I said that he is God, he can use, he can change the world, but he used us as an example. Why he did that? Because the first community of humankind, Adam and Eve, they were deceived by Satan. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to do that all myself. He is a good dad. He is a good father. He is a good mother. He is teaching his children 
to be, become brave to deal with problems. That's what we all fathers and you know, mothers do, good guardians do, or good teachers. Good teachers always expect their followers to be better than them. I, th I think logical people are like that. Logical professors, teachers, always want their, their you know, uh, disciples to be better than them. This is what, you know, we are rooted in Christ. Our branches also should be in Christ. <coughs> Without me, you cannot bear fruit. So we, if we are not bearing fruit, again, we need to read that gospel and, you know, discover that logic. You know, you just... You cannot say I'm a follower. I mean, you can't say that. That doesn't make sense that I am in Jesus, but I'm not bearing fruit. I'm not taking risk. You take risk. You do that. And one of my friends actually in front of others asked me, and his daughter was sitting there. He said, I mean, God is in control. Why we are killing each other? Why we should take, you know, it seriously. Take a little bit easy. I said, okay, <laughs> suppose, Today is the last day in the world. Flood comes and takes your child, and she's screaming, Dad, help me, help me, please. Do you say to your child, Bye, darling, today is the last day, don't worry. Or do you jump and help? He said, I jump and help. Why? Because of your root. You're always there to bear fruit. You know, the, life is logic in Jesus Christ. If you do not have fruit, then you need to put a question mark in front of your life in Jesus Christ. So you're right, and our societies really, our churches are not doing enough. We are not doing enough. If we are able to prepare ourselves, you know, church is the university of God. Church is the school of Jesus Christ. We don't need those blasphemous, ungodly universities. They are doing everything without any reason, you know? And actually, there was no university. Everything started from church. Churches started the schools and universities, and then it became popular for all over the world. So we need to really go back to our root in Christ. Pastors, leaders, Please start the sacrificial life. Cry to your elders. Cry to your brothers and sisters. We need to do something in this South Africa. You know, spend time, spend money. First of all, pre prepare yourself. Have discipline in your life. Half an hour a week, spend time and see who God of Islam is, who God of Christianity is. What is the difference? What I need to do? These are the things that you can learn. I mean, this our meeting here. I'm, I'm sure it's very building meeting by the grace of God. So we talk to each other to encourage each other. But don't forget it after one week. Please don't do that. Remind, remember that how God has worked in my life. You know, I'm, I'm still working. I need your prayers. I need your encouragement. Some of you came and encouragement. Thank you. And I know that all of you have that heart. But let us encourage each other to live as, you know, the member of his body. Please don't worry for loss. That's okay. If God wants you to lose, lose it. You're, going, you're not going to take anything with you. Thank you. God bless you. So, Daniel, there was one last question in the back. The gentleman said, it is uh, often said that Iran has the fastest growing church in the world. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, is that your experience or any other comments on that statement? Well, um, people are coming, coming to the Lord. They are discovering that He is the source of every good thing, socially, politically, economically. We are able to describe them, other brothers and sisters. That one thing among Iranians is so blessing and encouraging. They are coming to the Lord. They do not keep quiet. They talk. You meet every Iranian has come to the Lord, just had zeal to talk. Because they have seen hell, they know what heaven is in Jesus. But you haven't seen that hell, but unfortunately you're waiting for that hell. Don't wait. Don't allow. You know, sacrifice. That's why it's amazing that Paul is sacrificing his life for you and I. 
We need to do that. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, friends. Uh, that's the end of our program. We need to get Daniel to the airport for his flight to Port Elizabeth. So thank you so much for coming today. I'm just going to hand over to Francois to close the day in prayer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Shall we stand? Yes, this is stand. Well, we are such a blessed people to be able to hear these things now. We still got our life, so much of life ahead of us, or so many opportunities, so much of your goodness to experience every day and to allow to flow through us to others. And I really do pray that this would, would not just be something that makes us feel good for being here today, but actually would stir our hearts, Lord, to allow your life and your love to flow through us and impact the world and change the world. And that they would be, as we meet again, Lord, in other places of the world, with Daniel or Gustav or others, or even one day in heaven, Lord, can, can see the fruit produced by this talk, actually, in our lives with plenty of other people in your kingdom. And so, would you continue with us, stir us, Lord, we pray, and thank you for this incredible gift of a life lived for you and that, that what we could taste from that. So we bless you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone.